Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Not Too Comic Book. This being a show, we're talking about TV shows that are adaptations of comic books. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about the latest episode of DC Stargirl. A lot of really interesting things went down in this episode, so let's break it down. First and foremost, let's start off with Sylvester. I think it's so interesting that, once again, that attitude getting the best of him, that he's with the... Um, He's with um, Yolanda and um, Rick, and he sees that ISA picture, and it's just kind of like a, yeah, that's going to rub him the wrong way, because it's like, yeah, here's a picture, a reminder of everyone that helped kill you and your friends and everyone you cared about, and it's just like, oh, I hate him, and he's like, oh, it's almost like they're mocking me, and it's like, yeah, he's like, oh, whoever did this, whether it's Dragon King or whoever, they're going down, and you can tell, like, Yolanda and Rick are freaked out, which even he recognizes that when he was talking to Barbara, he's like, yeah, I kind of flipped out on it, he's just like, I'm not the mentor type, like, the fact is, he's like, I can't can't do what Pat does. And um, and obviously, you know, it's just kind of... Barbara talked about it and brought up a really interesting conversation about the whole, like... For so long, it was just Courtney and Barbara. But then, like, Pat coming into our life with Mike, it had to be a readjustment. Because I was like, I didn't know how to be in Mike's life. And, you know, Sylvester was like, well, how about you and Mike now? And she's like... He's my son, and she's basically like, I can't even imagine my life otherwise. I was like, that's so beautiful. Just like, you know, especially in season one, specifically. I don't think it yeah, I think it was season one. Um, it definitely shifted for Courtney, and she looked at Pat as more of a father. That, like, her saying that, too, I was like, oh, that's really sweet. They are, they are a family. Because for a long time, like, I think... Mike has warmed up, and I think he does look at Barbara as his mom, But because for so long, he would treat her just like, I think he would even just call her Barbara. He wouldn't even treat her like a mom. But um, I think that played a role in Sylvester, like, lightening up, lighting, light, lighting up a little bit uh, later on in the episode when he was talking to the JSA, because they kind of went against Courtney when it came to the whole Cameron thing, which is understandable why they'd have their reservations, because it's like, yeah, you're dating, not only just, you're not just dating the, uh, son of one of the supervillains, you're dating the son of the main leader supervillain of the, um, ISA, so of course it's going to rub them the wrong way. Plus, they haven't always had the best relationship with the children of the supervillains. I mean, and I think Yolanda has that very complicated thing. It's like Henry's kind of an exception and just the way things played out. So yeah, it's like, plus Cindy is a great example of like how that worked out. The Fiddler's son, there's just, it just hasn't worked out great. So it's like, of course, you know, and because they also feel like her judgment is blinded because the fact is, hey, she likes Cameron. I even love that that's why Courtney went to Cindy first. It's like, why are you telling me? It's like, shouldn't you be talking to your, like, basically, like, shouldn't you be talking to Yolanda about this? It's like, well, yeah, but you're the one person I know that would not judge me because she knew everyone else would judge her. And I was like, when she said that, I was like, yeah, it's true. They kind of would. Beth wouldn't. I think Beth is also too nice to really ever be, like, super blunt like that. Rick and um, Yolanda, not as much. Uh, especially where Rick and Cameron are currently. It's like, yeah, they butt heads a lot. Maybe because they are a little bit the same. And maybe, like, when... Rick looks at Cameron, he sees a lot of who he, because he doesn't really understand, like, I mean, he knows who Cameron is, like, oh, I know your Icicles, son, your dad is a bad person, I mean, obviously, Grundy was sent to kill his parents, so, like, he has every reason to just have that agitation as well, but it's also, I think, maybe on some level, uh, Rick sees so much of himself in Cameron, who he used to be, so, walking around so angry with a chip on your show, they have so much in common in some regards, because even, um, he's like, oh yeah, the kid's got, you know, he's like, got anger issues or whatever, and she's like, what, you don't, uh, Courtney was like, oh, you don't get angry, and it's like, yeah, it is true, there's, there's a lot of parallels between them, but circling back, yeah, and I love that line from Cindy, where she was like, Oh, you don't want to tell him about his father because it's like, right, don't you wish you could go back to when you thought Starman was your dad? It's like, don't make him like us. And it's like, that was a, you know, it, she, you know, once again, it's what Courtney wanted. She loves how blunt and, you know, um, Cindy is. She won't sugarcoat it, but it is coming from a place of, we both have, 
shitty fathers. And we don't want to take that from Cameron because Cameron idolizes his father. His father was his everything, the fa his foundation. He holds on to his dad being a good guy. He's like, you, you shatter that. Who knows how Cameron will react? So we'll, we'll, we'll circle back to the, some of the Cindy and, um, and, uh, Cameron stuff. But, uh, with the JSA, you know, Starman was, uh, you know, Sylvester was like, don't go about things this way. It's like, you guys did kind of get a little judgmental and kind of turn against him. It's like, wait, you're on her side. He's like, no, there are no sides. We're all in a JSA together. He's like, learn from my mistake. Because I wanted to kill uh, Bruce Gordon, it divided the JSA. It made us choose sides and we can never repair. Like if I'd listened to Pat, you know, and maybe made more of an attempt to like repair the JSA, you know, that's that was our undoing. Don't let it be yours. Learn from my mistakes. Him kind of playing more of that mentorship role was pretty interesting. And him kind of dishing out the orders being like, right, you have reservations about Cindy Yolanda. Go track, uh, go uh, look into her, follow your gut. Uh, Rick, keep working on that hourglass. And Beth, the whole family dynamic, because it's like her family wants to get involved. And I did not remember. That had to come up season one, and I just don't remember that. I guess, cause, I mean, it's been so long. Like, Because season one came out 20... Yeah, didn't it come out 2020? Yeah, it came out 2020. So I was like, yeah, it's, it's been two years ago. So like, I, I, won't rem I wouldn't remember it. But it's like, yeah, um, Starman's sister was Henry, was Brainway's wife such Henry's mom, and I didn't remember that. And that's for him, it's like, right, that's the terrible thing about when a superhero's, like, loved ones get involved in something. It's like, it can end tragically like that. So Beth's like, what do I do? And he's like, protect the family. That comes first. And so she cuts her family out of it. It's like, they were so happy about this. This way, like, her family got to be a part of her life. Yeah, they were kind of annoying and a little overprotective. And I think it's ironic that Beth has to be the one like, yes, I'm the superhero here, even though I'm a, I'm the child, but you guys need to stay out of this because I don't want you guys to get caught up in this. It's dangerous. Once again, the irony behind it. Even though, like, last episode, um, after seeing Starman, uh, Beth's parents see, like, oh, the dangers of this. And I'm surprised they didn't push back more, but it's like, right, you are the superhero. We're not. We'll take your, on. you, you know, they don't want, I think they don't want to push back, but I think eventually they will because it's like, no, we're going to have to meet halfway because you're worried about us. It's like, no, we're the parents. We should be worried about you. You are doing this whole superhero thing. And that'll probably come up more if, if Beth ever finds herself in that situation, like, um, beat up like Courtney was before or even beat up like Sylvester was. So that's definitely going to be an interesting dynamic to kind of keep it focused on is Beth and her family. Cause I think the, the pendulum shift is going to swing the other way soon enough, but we'll have to wait and see. Which I also thought it was interesting when Cindy like confronted Cameron and she was like pushing his button saying like, Oh, like, does because I thought like oh you're trying to do the friend thing of looking out for Courtney which she kind of was she just went about it in a very 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 Cindy way but kind of being a dick about it uh but she was pushing Cameron's button I was like why are you doing that and she saw him display his powers I'm like oaks is that what you were trying to do like are you trying to be a friend to check and see whether Cameron really is a good guy or not but um she sees that his power is activating he was like right the fact that you're saying all that stuff to me proves you haven't changed and she's like Maybe it's like the fact is she's bothering to do that because she's actually worried about Courtney. She doesn't want Courtney to get mixed up with you when you're bad. And so she tells Courtney, it's like, right, he's got the same thing his his uh, grandparents is like, but you already knew. And it's like, yeah, I'm helping Cameron with it. It's like the fact is she's like cut bait and leave. I've seen this story play out so many times. I've seen this story play out before. It doesn't end well. We know how it ends. So it's just kind of like. She was just purely pushing his buttons to see whether or not he is still that same person that ain't like that. That's where Courtney's going to com find a complicated place at. Well, because it's not even just the JSA, like her friends that are against this whole thing. Even Cindy's like, don't do this. It's not going to end well. And that's the sad thing is it could go either way, but it most likely will go bad just for drama's sake, just for the confliction of a superhero being torn between love and going after, you know, trying to stop the bad. Like, because the thing is, what Courtney's got against her is 
well, you don't want to destroy the image of his father. And if you try to, he probably won't believe you. Plus, he's got his grandparents who, for one, don't like you. They already see you spending time with him, especially like together. The fact is he's showing off his powers to you. They super don't like that because they want him to follow in his father's footsteps. So, Cameron, you've already got a disadvantage because they're going to try and sway Cameron to their side. They'll probably like say things. I mean, all they have to do is tell him about what happened to Icicle beforehand if they tell him like oh what happened to your dad is her and her gang of the JSA pretending to be good guys it's like well yeah your dad was going to try and mind control and enslave like a good chunk of the population of this country uh, also your father was a murderer so yeah let's not mince words there but it's like once again even if you tell him the truth it's his foundation and who knows like that might be the thing that completely like put breaks his like his his psyche could get shattered and he could go full psycho and lose himself like very uh Jekyll and Mr. Hyde thing which I almost wonder does Cindy kind of have a similar thing to that because that's what I initially thought when she walked up with saying all that stuff to Cameron I'm like oh is that not actually Cindy is that like dragon side of her taking control or something because when we saw the murder of uh, the gambler, her, uh, blade was out. It didn't seem like it was covered. It wasn't covered in blood, though, at least from what we saw. So, she probably was like, huh, it's someone here. I, I was like, she was probably like ready in like attack mode when she discovered the body. I don't think she killed him, but it could be a thing. Like, like I kept bringing up before, as we see with her situation, her conditioning is getting worse and she's becoming more dragon like, like her father. So, once again, the conversation is, is it kind of a Jekyll and Mr. Hyde thing where she's losing control and maybe she blacked out and she doesn't remember that she did it when in actuality she did. But I'm thinking maybe she just showed up then, had her blade up because she was like, okay, is someone still around? And yes, she still did, did the duplicitous thing of like, oh, I took the gambler's computer, but she saw an opportunity. And I love that she finally did get into his computer, but she had to like use... Uh, the gambler to like hack the gambler, which once again, I love the, that annoying message of like, haha, sorry, you're wrong about the password and laughing maniacally in your face every time you get the password wrong. But she finally got it unlocked. Granted, she had to kind of immediately get on a run because Starman, Yolanda and Rick were on their way. So she did go to one of her father's other um, labs, which is the one. Uh, Sylvester ended up visiting earlier, which I love when he used uh, this uh, cosmic staff and he was like, wow, you have other functions too, because it basically acted as like a leaf blower. So that was pretty uh, neat. But neither one of them really found anything. Uh, she's hoping that whatever answers she needs to fix whatever's going on with her are there. Once again, if she was a little more open with the rest of the team, but it's like, right, you're trying to do everything you can to get them to trust you and Telling them the truth wouldn't get them trusting you. It just make them more wary of you. So, but it's also like Cindy doesn't have the easiest time fully relying on people. It's like, yeah, I'll team up with you, but in the end, I'm just using you. You're a means to an end to accomplish what I want. So, a full blown equal team effort is something she's still not used to. Even when she was doing the, you know, junior ISA stuff last season, it's still, you know. So we'll, we'll see. But speaking also of Cindy, I love that she uh, helped out uh, Jakeem and Mike, especially with the whole situation of, well, because Mike's taking Sylvester's advice, who he was, you know, I love that he's alphabetizing everything in the pantry. And it's like, oh, you don't like me much. He's like, oh, yeah, you know, because we're so different. You know, Mike's like, yeah, you're JSA. I'm not. He's like, well, you know. It's like, I was, it's not like we were some well-oiled machine where we liked everyone, we were best friends. He's like, yeah, Dr. Fate couldn't stand me. I mean, I was more annoying to him than, you know, uh, his nemesis. It's like, oh, what is that? Is that a skin disease? He's like, no, that's Dr. Fate's nemesis. Interesting timing. I mean, to be fair, Dr. Fate was already set up back in season one of this show, but it's still just interesting timing because, you know, Dr. Fate is going to be in the Black Adam movie, which is, I mean, which also isn't too much of a surprise considering the Black Adam movie includes the Justice Society of America, so it's not that wild, you know, but still. Um, either way, I love that. It's just like, to be fair, he might have had a skin disease because he was green, but that's kind of beside the point. It's like, right, I was, when I was, what was it, the Star Bengal kid or whatever, it's like, I didn't really get any recognition. No one believed I could do what I could do, so I had to go out there and prove him wrong. And so Mike's like, right, Jakeem, we got to do it. We got to prove ourselves, you know, and... 
Once again, always uh, that wishing never works out. Once again, you gotta be super specific, and still, even then, it doesn't work out. It's like, right, uh, make the bullies nice to us. Like, cool, give us our money, give us your money, please, or we're gonna beat the ever living hell out of your like handsome faces. Luckily, Cindy was there, and I love that. If you look at the screen when she's walking away, there's almost like this like pink like hue around the edges of the screen. I was like. Oh, it's, and I was like, is that Mike? It's like, no, 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 it's Jakeem. It's like, oh, he's in love. You know, and Cindy walking away kind of feeling like, yeah, I'm so cool. And it's just like, I love that Mike's like, hey, like, we should work together. Like, oh, the JSA, they don't really trust you, but us, the All-Stars will trust you. It's like, yeah, you're someone with your skills, you should be appreciated. And Jakeem's like, even worship. And Mike turns and his eyes are bulging out like, what the hell is wrong with you? Like, don't say that. But she has no intention of joining because she's like, okay, I might be trying to get into the JSA, but I'm not going to join the Rookie League. It's like, oh, that's never going to happen. But she's like, sorry, that's, I'm saying that in the nicest way possible and just kind of walks away kind of laughing at them. So that kind of blew up in their faces. Um, granted, uh, the answers to what they're trying to do are a little closer than they uh, thought. Granted, uh, Yolanda does find out at the end of the episode uh, she breaks into Cindy's place, which maybe that came up before and I completely forgot how self-absorbed Cindy is. Because, like, there's so many. There's, like, a big photo outside of her room in the hallway on the wall. Then there's all those photos in her room. It's like, well, when no one else would show you love, if, you know, your dad sure as hell wasn't going to show you love. It would make you a little narcissistic and try to find love where you can get it from yourself. But to be fair, that could be overcompensation because you do dislike yourself a lot. I mean, you have a lot of trauma. You haven't, well, you dealt with some of that trauma, but I think there's still a lot of that brewing underneath you. Not wanting to be like your father, hating your father, but also wanting his respect and love. It being more than just an experiment to him. And also like, well, you're also responsible, sadly, for killing your mom. So like, there's just, there's a lot. Also, we had Sylvester um, telling... Uh, Rick about the what is essentially the limiter of uh, the hourglass and he's like how am I supposed to be our man when I can't even like keep my powers for like 20 minutes or two minutes at a time and it's like oh yeah like that thing I'm a jig like yeah that's the only thing that that's what keeps the limiters like wait if I took that out I'd be our man like all the time and it's like the moment Sylvester said that I was like I get where you're trying to come from, Sylvester, but that was the wrong thing to do. You should not have said that to him because now he's going to think like, hey, I should do it. Sylvester's like, hey, your dad put that in there for a reason. And um, I think they discussed it in season one. Like, I think Pat even talked about it. It's like, right, because it's to limit yourself. Because if you could be our man all the time, it's like... It makes you want to. It makes you use that sparingly because having a limit on that much power, absolute power, corrupts absolutely. But then you can start getting to the into the conversation of, well, what about Superman? He's super strong all the time. Yeah, but even he limits himself. He knows when and when not to go balls to the wall. Like he kind of typically has a tendency to not go full all out unless the circumstances call for it. Unless we're dealing with like a full blown dark side thing, then it's like, yo, you might want to go nuts here a little bit. Either way. But it's like, yeah, he removes the limit and I'm like, oh, that's going to be bad. Because it's like, right, right. Once again, has anger issues and you allow him to have super strength all the time. Yeah, you're, you're, you need those limits to be able to not get completely absorbed by that power. Because if you feel like that all the time, eventually it's going to go to your head. The point is to be limited. That way, once again, you use that power sparingly, but it also, it's, it's a checks and balance. It makes sure that you're not able to just kind of use it whenever you want to. That one hour a day, you get this super strength. And so, because if you have it all the time, you start losing perspective on, um, on that strength and strength that is just with no limits can turn tyrannical, essentially, you know, once again, you need those checks and balances to it all. So obviously it's like a, that we're talking a very superhero context here, but obviously that applies. It should apply on a very geopolitical level all across the board doesn't always, you know, I mean, not every, you know, so it's like, yeah, it's a larger conversation that could be having in general when it comes to real life, but we're just talking about it in a superhero context here. But I think the same um, concerns and um, 
reasoning can be held here, you know, as in, like, you would have that conversation in real life about power, too, so. I also love that uh, Barbara and Pat are kind of going on a date, because Pat's noticing that, oh, like, the fact is, Courtney's smiling all the time, and she's like, oh, like, she's not really diving into the star girl of it all, because he's like, oh, the others are looking into things, what are you going to do? She's like, I'm just going to go do my homework. It's like, even Barbara's like, this is kind of what we wanted. We wanted her to kind of just focus on her normal life, but even Pat's like, yeah, but I think there's the father part of him like, yeah, but it's weird, because being like that whole thing of just like being so gun ho about the star girl stuff is kind of part of who Courtney is part of her personality. So kind of having that taken away, it just seems a little weird, but then obviously uh crusher and Paula sit down and it's like, yeah, we've been, uh, you know, interrogating people who had any connections to the gambler. Yeah. We got them to talk by like dangling them off the building. And it's like, you know, and, and they're both kind of laughing about it. And Paula's looking, I mean, Barbara's like, kind of looking like what and Paula looks at her like smiling at first but, but no 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 it's it's not like that which i say well he probably doesn't exist in this continuity well we don't know like the full extent of what heroes exist in this universe outside of the JSA um because i was about to say that's a that seems like a very batman like um approach to things so it's not like your like, super, like, oh my god, villainous. It's like, yeah, because even certain heroes in its universe handle things in that way, so. It's like, well, shouldn't there be stuff you should be watching? Shouldn't you be this or your cholesterol? He's like, hey, our cholesterol levels are perfect or immaculate or something like that. But he's also like, right, all this do-gooder stuff, it's done wonders for us, our, our sex life, essentially. And it's just kind of like, cool, cool, exactly the conversation we wanted to have. Quite a lot of really, really, really interesting things went down in this episode. I'm really curious to ultimately see where all of this ends up taking us going forward into the next episode. But really, that's all I want to talk about. To the next time we meet, be happy, be safe, love light to the fullest, and enjoy it. Good day, and good